Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to tonight's planning committee meeting. My name is Peter Richards. I will be chairing the meeting this evening. Uh, some housekeeping we've made to start with. We're not expecting there to be a fire alarm, so if one does go off, please follow us uh, slowly out towards the car park um, over the road next to the pub. Um, we will need to check your names off uh, before you uh, head off uh, back to your, your own home. So if you wouldn't mind just making sure you do go over there and get your name checked off so we can make sure everyone's out of the building safely, that would be great. Um, mobile phones, if you could please turn them off or at the very least they're silent. I do appreciate sometimes there is a need for an emergency message now and again. So at the very least silent but preferably off. As long as they don't interfere with the flow of the meeting, um, that will be fine. The meeting itself is a meeting in public. It is not a public meeting, so only those people that are registered to speak will be permitted to do so. At the appropriate time, I will call you forward to one of the array of uh, microphones in front of you. Um, you will notice we do have some new AV kit. Um, it will be the button on the right of the uh, whichever microphone you choose. It will go red, as you can see here, and if you stay around about a, a hand's width away um, and speak out the microphone, it will pick you up much better. Um, I will, of course, give you a, uh, a warning before uh, your time is up, but we'll talk about that as and when we bring you forward. Um, okay, uh, let us go through uh, some introductions, if I may start with. So on my far right, we have, have Howard Allison from our committee services uh, team. To my immediate right, we have Amy Shipley, who is our solicitor, and our planners, in no particular order, are Joe Brooke, Emma Booker, Malwine Zek, and Alice Kosnett. Alice is our planning manager and I believe has a statement to make. Thank you, Chairman. My role is to provide impartial advice and to assist members in their decision taking. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, do we have any apologies for absence, please, Howard? Yes, Chair. We have apologies from Councillors Foreman, Councillor Hedge Seraphin, and Councillor Parry. Thank you very much. And members, do we have any disclosures of interest, please? Councillor Mills first. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the um, first application here, or application uh, four on the agenda, um, I'll be sitting out on that, Mr. Chairman, and also on the last one, um, eight on the agenda for Warmington. Uh, I'm the county councillor for this uh, ward, but um, I haven't um, made any, any conversations with anybody on this, so I'm approaching this with an open mind, Mr. Chairman. Thank Lovely you. stuff. Thank you very much. Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Chair. Um, item number five on the agenda, 22-03414. Um, I've had a site, made a site visit. I've read all the objections from various residents. I've had a number of conversations with residents as well. Um, <clears throat> but I've also had advice from the monitoring officer I spoke to shortly before the meeting. Um, and I assured him that I was predeter non -prede <laughs> not predetermined and that he was happy for me to take part in the debate and the meeting. Understood. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No, in that case, minutes. Is everyone happy with the minutes from the 25th of January? Yeah, yeah marvellous. I'll sign those later on. Right, let's move to our first application of the evening then, which is application reference 21-03858 FUL, land south of Kyneton Road in Gaydon. Our presenting officer is Joe Brooke. Joe, over to you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. The application site is located on the edge of Gaydon, as indicated by the black dot before you. The application is proposing the development of 23 dwellings. As sat out in the officer's report, 16 of the dwellings will be designated as local need dwellings, with an additional seven dwellings as open market properties. The application site is considered to be outside the built of area boundary, as detailed in the report, and was originally included in the site allocation plan, but subsequently removed because of harm to the listed building. So as a plan before you, that is the application site in Red Line Boundary. The development there is Edge Hill View, Kyton Road, and you lead down Edge Hill View into the application site. The listed building is Grey 2 is the Lees located to the north. This is the site layout as proposed. As you can see, Edge Hill, Edge Hill View comes into the site area. You have a parking area situated to the front of the, allocated, of the private road coming in. A SUDS allocation will be the, situated in this location. The open market housing will be to the south of the site facing the open countryside. And a public open space will be located to the west, uh, east of the site. And additionally, this is the built up area boundary of Gaydon as defined in the draft SAP and also in their draft NDP. This is a Google Earth for the image, just for members' um, information. 
So at the minute, this is the application site, the majority of it. It's being used as a site compound for the development of Edge Hill View, but there is no law for development certificate application, so it has to be treated as open countryside. This is all detailed in the report. The application will extend, if permitted, to this area, but this will be the open space area. This building is the lead, which is Grade 2 listed, and the associated gardens. This uh, plan indicates where the uh, housing mix is going to be. So housing associated rent is going to be situated within red to the front of the site. The shared ownership is in green, so located on near the boundaries of um, Gaydon built pair boundary, and also type G housing, which is also part of the shared ownership. Owner occupier at discounted sale, and the applicant has confirmed that that will be obliged for section 106 will be situated within blue and then the open market units obviously facing the open countryside and they are in pink. This is a design of the dwellings. Uh, fundamentally, the 23 dwellings will be constructed out of a mix of red brick, white render and grey roof slate and will be set from 5.9 metres, these are the bungalows, to 8.8 .8 metres in height for the two storeys. A brick soldier course is proposed over the windows with some brick arches with brick sills. The dwellings would also incorporate a mixture of fronted gables, however this is mainly to the two-storey dwellings, open-ended gables and hip roofs, whilst the two-storey houses are proposed with chimneys and front door canopies. So quickly run through the design. So here's more indicative images of the two-storey and the bungalows. And finally the bungalow and also the two-storey element with a sub down. So this is the compound site at the minute. As you can see, it is gated off for access, but the site is still relatively open, um, which shows there is some hard standing area, but lawfully that is open countryside. This is Edge Hill View, which is directly adjacent to the site. So you can see on the Google Earth image where it is coming down and the properties and how they are representative of the proposed dwellings. This is the grade two lees, so that is circled in red there, which would adjoin the boundary, white rendered thatched roof. This is the lees garden area. Development would be situated through that sort of opening there. And this is then right up to the boundary of the lees. The open space element would be located along here with the residential element just coming into there. And that's the Hill view that you can see in the outline. And this is taken from the public footpath of the Prowl, which is down to the south of the site. So that's the Hill view, and the development would encompass most of that area indicatively. And that's the end of the presentation. In summary, as set out in the officer report, there are five reasons for refusal. And as such, the application is considered not to meet an identified community need, is not truly community-led, and would result in an unwarranted development of seven open market dwellings, which overall would cause undue harm to local landscape beyond the settlement boundary of Gaydon and less than substantial harm towards the higher end of the setting of the Grade 2 listed building. Furthermore, the communal parking and the parking for plots 7 and 23 is considered to cause undue harm to overall design and layout of the scheme. Insufficient information has also not been provided in respect to visitor parking, visitor displays, visibility displays, and surface water drainage. The application is therefore considered to be contrary to the policy stipulations of the area's development plan. I will also mind members to look at the update sheet because they are a number. Um, the request for the substitute ward member, the uh, submission of additional information which me as acting case officer is refused to accept, clarity over the independent viability assessment for basically there was a viability report submitted which was independently assessed by Alfredson and Young and there's also an update to the conclusion section which identifies further harm to the grade 2 listed building. And that is it Chair. Joe, thank you very much indeed. Members, it's obviously quite a substantial update. Have you all had an opportunity to read it? Yeah, marvellous. In that case, we will call our first speaker of the evening, who is Councillor Adrian Claxon of Gaydon Parish Council. Good evening, sir. And welcome. 
Um, now, as I said earlier on, uh, you will have three minutes. I will give you a 30-second warning. Now, unfortunately, I did have a button that used to make a noise, but I think I've <laughs> overused it, and they've disabled it today. Uh, so um, I will have to speak over you. But um, as soon as you're ready, comfortable, and settled, uh, the time will be yours. Okay. Um, item one, the Parish Council fully supports this application as it, as it fully satisfies the needs of the recent housing survey, housing needs survey that was carried out by the Parish Council. Um, item two, the majority of the objections are from the residents of Edge Hill View, phase one, who were always aware that the phase, w phase two was on the cards. I item three, further objections from the Hi Highways and Floodings Authority have been addressed and unofficially accepted by those authorities. However, the authorities have been denied the opportunity to accept them officially. Um, by the planning department. Therefore, if the committee is not minded to accept this application on, on the current information, we request that the decision be deferred until the committee is in possession of the latest information. Well, I can confirm that as well within your three minutes, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> Members, do we have any uh, questions? Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions for our, our parish council representative? No? In that case, Councillor Claxton, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. OK, we'll move to our next speaker, who is Julian Hardwick. Good evening. So, Mr Hardwick, um, in the same way, you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30-second warning before your time is up. Otherwise, whenever you're settled, comfortable and ready to go, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm uh, here to speak on <coughs> behalf of Catherine Tasukas, who owns the Lees Gaden, and who's one of the many objectors to this application. The Lees is a Grade Two listed thatched cottage, which dates from the late 1600s or early 1700s. It is situated on the edge of the village and is a significant feature of the community. The proposed development abuts the garden of the Lees on two sides in close proximity to the cottage itself, as you can see from the plan, which I hopefully is going to be shown to you, which is uh, one that um, I have um, uh, taken from the planning application and amended to highlight the uh, location of the Lees and the Lees garden in relation to both the proposed development and uh, the existing phase one development. Uh, uh, I, I think that you can see from that uh, just how dominant this proposed de development uh, would be. The whole of the proposed development uh, is on what is currently uh, open countryside outside the built-up area boundary of Gaden. Uh, the photograph, uh, which I think you're going to see in a moment, uh, is taken from the garden of the, of the Lees and shows the area which the proposed development would cover. Two separate, completely objective heritage assessments have concluded that a development on this site would cause considerable harm to the Lees. The first of these was by Purcell Consultants on behalf of Stratford District Council, which resulted in the whole site being removed from Stratford Council's site allocation plan. The second was undertaken by Stratford District Council Conservation in its comments on this specific planning application. I draw your attention to their conclusions, which are quoted on page 19 of the planning uh, of the agenda, and which highlight the adverse impact this proposed development would have. Allowing a development of this scale would clearly be contrary to the provisions of the national planning policy framework by causing the upper level of less than substantial harm to the setting of a grade two listed building. Moreover, there are a large number of additional grounds for refusing this application. While it purports to be a community-led scheme to meet local needs, it fails the key tests for such a development. It has been strongly criticised by Stratford Council's Development and Policy Enabler Officer, as you'll have seen in the Planning Officer's report. Although Gaydon uh, Parish uh, did not object to the application, uh, 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 until this evening it has only given it very lukewarm support. Uh, uh, and I would just... Uh, comment that although many of the, 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 the objectors, uh, are, of whom there are a significant number, 24 letters of objection compared to just five in support, uh, certainly were aware, aware that uh, a 
phase two was, was proposed, uh, that the, the scale of the proposal is significantly greater than they were led to believe. Uh, the, um, it cannot, uh, given the scale of local of, of opposition, it cannot be considered to be a community-led scheme. And in the context of a small village like Gaydon, there is no way that a development of 23 dwellings can be regarded as small scale. It is clear that, in reality, this is an attempt to engineer an open market housing development by dressing it up as a local housing need. The applicant has been trying for several years to build on this site, to extend his earlier commercial housing development called Edge Hill View Phase 1, situated to the, to the west. Indeed, the name given to this application, Edge Hill View Phase 2, completely gives the game away about the applicant's true intentions. His plan features seven open market uh, houses situated in unsport countryside and outside the settlement boundary, which is completely contrary to plan policy. Moreover, this is in a village which has no need for any such additional dwellings given the available land supply. I endorse everything the planning officer has said in his recommendations and report, which amount to a damning indictment of this whole application. I hope very much that this committee will endorse his conclusions and refuse the application. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. Thank you very much indeed for that. And I'm going to have to make an apology. I said three minutes, whereas in fact you did have six. Yes. <laughs> and you have, you have extended over the three, but you are well within the six. So I just thought I'd make that clear for everyone. Thank uh, you. So, they know. so apologies for that. Um, do we have any questions, members? No? In that case, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Thank you. Okay, and our final speaker on this item is Mr. Peter Frampton, our agent. Thank you, Chairman. I doubt there is anybody in this room with a housing need. I envisage we all live comfortably in our homes. For those with a housing need, every day is a misery. Not being able to settle in a community, not being able to settle children into schools, living in inadequate accommodation. Relentless stress is caused. The Parish Council has just made clear that this proposal fully meets the parish's identified need. The policy test of the support of the local community is set out in the Development Requirements SPD. It states schemes must have the support of the local community, it est the parish council. The test is not as suggested in the planning officer's report of community support absolute. Sadly, in all communities there are those who do not want any more houses. So absolute support is an unreasonable bar for satisfying the requirement of community support and is not required by planning policy. This report does not bring to your attention national planning policy for rural housing introduced after the adoption of the core strategy, namely the framework power 77, which states, local planning authorities should, note the imperative, support opportunities to bring forward rural exception sites that will provide affordable housing to meet identified local needs and consider whether allowing some market housing on these sites would help facilitate this. So the core strategy is not consistent with up-to-date national policy, which is a significant material consideration. The applicant has provided the council, as you've heard from the planning officer, additional information. Uh, the applicant has responded to the comments raised by Avis and Young based on bills of quantity to support the robustness of the viability appraisal. Your officer has presently declined to action the consultation process with this additional information. And I note in the report some comments are made on the detail, detail of the layout. I'm advised that these two can be readily addressed. This is not a speculative application. It is purposely presented for planning permission to, to meet an identified need, a fundamental requirement of the planning system. The framework at 56 says, it is important that the needs of groups with specific housing requirements are addressed. So I'm making an unusual request to the committee this evening, and that is twofold. One, the consideration of this application is deferred to enable your officer to progress the consultations. Two, a site visit is held so members can inform their own judgment of the impact of housing upon the significance of the lays as a listed building. The planning balance can thereafter be undertaken as to where the overall public interest lies at a later committee meeting with hopefully all technical and design issues settled. Uh, and your last speaker said there was no housing need. Clearly, 
uh, that is not correct from the comments made on behalf of the Parish Council. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions for our agent, please? No? In that case, Mr Frampton, thank you very much for your time contribution this evening. Okay, let's move to points of clarification to our officers. Councillor Crump first, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Joe, can I just confirm that the, there are several objections that are still valid uh, in terms of the county highways. Um, the ecology is not valid now. That's, that's removed, hasn't it? Um, the flooding authority uh, and the development and policy enabler, as well as policy and conservation, the lows one still still valid, please. Live the, the, or valid, yeah. Yeah, on the information that's been assessed, all those are valid objections to the application including highways, LFA, and policy, naval officer, and SDC policy. Councillor Harvey, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, two questions. There are 24 letters of objection, and there are five letters of support. Can you tell us uh, the degree to which those are residents of, uh, of Gaydon, or whether they are from further afield, is one question. And second question I'd really appreciate some guidance on. <clears throat> um, the Parish Council has now indicated its full support for the application. Um, what is the test, given, given there are 24 letters of objection, what is the test that I should apply in assessing whether there is community support for this application? So in response to the first question, I can't conclusively tell you whether... whether where they are all from in Gaydon. The honest truth is in all applications, anybody anywhere can comment on the application. We still have to take that into consideration and support or objections for whatever re relevant planning reasons they submit. So I can't conclusively say one way or the other on that. In respect to the second question, one I should highlight that's the first time that Gaydon Paris Council have conclusively supported the scheme. As you can see in the officer's report, they, on two consultation responses, did recommend support, but wanted the, the application heard at planning committee. Secondly, the best way to probably set out the test then is if it is truly community-led, is actually set out by the policy enabler officer in the uh, principal section. And let me just get that up. Do apologise. So it is pretty much under the free tense that it is correct that at times the Paris Council offered full support, then that could be undertaken as full support from a community led scheme, which is set out in the SPD requirements. However, at the same time, the cover letter stated at that time that it was meant to, they wanted to be heard at planning committee and therefore it was given moderate weight. It is also noted that the written um, Council's Planning Committee due concerns and Seven Oak Mark dwellings. They've also got to verify that the proper consultation has then been undertaken. So if the Parish Council at the time were asking it to come to the Planning Committee, the SBD then requires the enabling officer states that proper consultation with the local public has taken place. That was that was never truly satisfied. So at that point, you've then got moderate weight given to the Paris Council's response because they offer support but recognise parishioners' concerns over it and wishes it come to the planning committee. Then you've got to make sure that proper consultation has taken place. That was never truly satisfied. At the same time, we've then got to take into account how many objections to the scheme have been submitted and how many have been supported. So you're doing a whole balancing exercise on all those elements. Now, I appreciate the Paris Council has showed up tonight and offered full support, but the honest truth is it's then got to be a waiting exercise if you believe the Paris Council full support now overrides the objections raised for this application. I will have to leave that to members to decide whether that is the case. If I can just come in, I, I completely concur with what uh, Joe has advised there. Um, the very 
simple way of putting it in terms of what the development requirements SPD requires. So it's part S, which relates to this type of housing. And it says that um, a parish or town council, oh, sorry, parish and town councils can decide the scheme, blah, blah, blah. The support of the local community will ordinarily be demonstrated by the written support of the town or parish council or a neighbourhood plan. So in normal cases, we would say that constituted the support of the parish and, and the community as a whole, but it's just those reasons that Joe set out that, that has moderated that, that support. Uh, Councillor Dixon first, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, has national planning policy changed at all regarding the provision of open housing to support affordable housing, if affordable housing can't be justified on economic grounds. Has anything nationally changed in that regard? So, Mr. Franton is absolutely right. The national policy does state that. But at the same time, national policy states that you have to be in accordance with the areas development plan led policies. The areas development plan and policies are the policies that are set out in the core strategy. So unless there was a material significant consideration to override and development plan and policies, we do not have a supporting policy to have open market housing, even with the local needs element. And this has been further identified by SDC policy and the policy enabling officer. And that is in, in legislation we have to follow the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Can I just follow on from that, if I may? I presume like a, a material consideration may well be the viability report, which is why we've had that and it has been assessed. Absolutely. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Curtis, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Joe, you, you had a photo showing the view of the development from the Lees house. Could you just bring that back up? Um, well, actually, that one. Can you... Just for clarification, is this development on the patch that is green in that photo or on the brown land further beyond? Clarificate, well, development is, but there will be open space on that green patch. So let me just go back to the, the better plan, to be honest, is the actual location plan. So here it is a good plan. So that the, the green open space will be along that patch there. And development will proceed there. So then you go to the location plan. So this is a Lee's Garden area. So development will take place on that whole area. Right. But as you can see from there, there will be a public open space between the Lee's building there. So it will become public open space rather than the farmland which it currently is. Thank you. That is correct. Councillor Kendall, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a quick clar uh, clarification. Um, I think the Parish Council said they had a uh, housing needs survey done. Um, can you clarify a little more? There's a housing needs survey, but we're saying there's no identified need. I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm struggling a little bit there. So, no, it's not so much... The housing needs survey was undertaken, and this is for 16 local needs dwellings. In the report, you can see there's discrepancy between the local needs dwellings and what's been provided here, even though appreciate the applicant has started negotiations with tenure and so forth, who's going to occupy them at a later date. The problem being with it, it's not so much there's not an identified need. You've got seven open market dwellings to facilitate the open market units, and that's not a policy requirement. And also, it's not, well, it wasn't truly believed to be community-led for the reasons that we've discussed before, not to be small scale and to be that. So there is an identified need, it's just this doesn't meet the policy requirements for it. Any other points of clarification, members? I've got one, if I may, Joe. So I can see on the update sheet that uh, some information has been submitted, and I think the agent referred to this, as, uh, that it hasn't been accepted here, um, and you've outlined your reasoning. I can see there, uh, you've, I think you're saying that there's been a number of amendments and additional information been submitted, including the viability report, since December 21. How many times have you had more information submitted that has required extra consultations? So we've had a number of consultations. We've done, undertook three 
detailed consultations. I've accepted a number of amendments, including one significant package of amendments, which included the viability report, even though officers' advice was to withdraw at that time. We then did do the viability report, and it was stated on the proviso that this would be the only one significant package of amendments. I should also highlight that in our acknowledgement letter that we send out to the applicants for all applications, it does state that we will negotiate during the course of the application, but is reinforced by government policy and guidance. It's for every effort to be made to ensure your scheme is acceptable before submitting through the use of professional agents, online guidance or pre-application advice where it's available. At the same time, our website even states that pre-application advice should be a sort and also is therefore often only one round of negotiations should be accepted. If necessary, it could be more for majors, but we have done three quite extensive consultations and this application has been going on for almost a year and a half. Okay, so um, I can see there's been three sets of additional information being submitted, including revised layouts and more viability assessment details, drainage strategies, they would all need to go out for further full consultation, is that correct? That is correct. Um, as I've been highlighted to you, the LFA and possibly highways have, will offer no objection. I haven't had that response, so I can't conclusively say that. At the same time, that information was directly submitted to them. I need to assess that information, and we need to go back out consultation to make sure there is no discrepancies. So, absolutely, all that would require further consultations. Understood. Thank you for making that clear. Councillor Dixon, please. Just one quick one, uh, Chairman, if I may. Um, just thinking that we've had the, the agent uh, of the applicants uh, also requesting a deferment of our decisions. Um, obviously, if we didn't defer a decision this evening and we followed the officer's recommendation, I'm just wondering if we have an opinion as what an inspector might say of having received that request for that deferment from the agent acting on behalf of the applicant? Um, we would not be able to second guess what a planning inspector may want to think or say. Um, I think the questions I've just asked to our uh, planning officer and the responses you've got pretty much explain the position as far as he's concerned. Um, does anyone else have any points of clarification before we move into the debate? Let's open up the debate. Who would like to kick us off? Councillor Adam first, please. Thanks. Um, uh, the officer's been very robust in explaining his reasons under fair questioning, and they're set out in very great detail in the report, and it does seem that due consideration to reasonable measures has been given over the length of the application period. With all that information and everything that I've seen so far, I can't see anything that outweighs the, the recommendation to refuse. I think that this, this does pose harm to the listed assets. I think there are issues amount, around the, the actual number of properties being proposed here and, and the type of properties. I, yeah, fr from my point of view, I, I, it, that it just does, isn't outweighed by anything that's been said in support of it. So I'm quite happy to propose that we go along with the officer's recommendation and refuse. Thank you very much. Councillor Kendall, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I won't go on any further. I think Councillor Adam said it all for me. Um, the case has not been made uh, to go against the officer's recommendation, so I'll second the uh, proposal to refuse. Thank you very much. Councillor Adam, please. I will be thirding. Uh, yeah, Joe's done a, a, a great job there it's not it doesn't fit with our policies and and we've tried to make it work and it still hasn't repeatedly so no i think i think it's council crump please yeah again very briefly um there's still several objections outstanding uh, there's anecdotal evidence that they've been overcome but we haven't got that evidence in front of us um and i can only go on the evidence in front of us and i will be supporting the officer's recommendation Thank you. Councillor Harvey, please. Again, uh, I go along with uh, uh, seconding, um, sorry, I go along with the, the officer's recommendation, but I do want to make one, one particular point. Um, on the basis that this is a local needs, that it has to have local community support. And under questioning, the key word that came out for me in uh, Alice's explanation was the word ordinarily. And it seems to me in this particular instance, the Parish Council seem to have been on the fence and actually now got off the fence in a particular direction. That's fine. 
but there are 24 objections, and in this context, 24 seems to me to be quite large, and I think uh, in these circumstances, ordinarily, uh, is the key word. So I, I'm, for all the other reasons one could talk, can find in the report, and that we've heard, I, I will be voting in support. Thank you very much. There's only two of you who haven't spoken. Don't feel the need to. Okay, in that case, well, I, I, I'll just chuck my, my thoughts in. I'm not going to go over what everyone else has said already because I can wholeheartedly agree, but what I would say is I think Joe has gone out of his way to be accommodating um, and we still haven't been able to overcome the statutory objection. So I, um, yeah, I think this is a terrific report and, and uh, well put together. Let's move to a vote. We have a proposal to refuse in line with the officer's recommendation. It has been seconded by Councillor Kendall. Could I have a show of hands for those in favour of refusal? That is unanimous. So, committee therefore resolves to refuse application 21-03858 FUL land south of Kyneton Road in Gaydon. Uh, now, members, I forgot to mention earlier on that we do in fact have an item tonight that has no speakers on, which means we can delegate it. So, um, I'm looking at, uh, I think it's item six on our agenda, um, reference 22-03-427 FUL and 22-02841 LBC. Um, I'm assuming that given, well, in line with our constitution, with no speakers, that we can move to delegate. I'm assuming everyone's happy with that, in which case we will delegate that, both the LBC and the full application. Okay, now let's go back to uh, application reference 22-03414 FUL, that is land belonging to 12 Clifford Chambers. Our presenting officer is Emma Booker. As soon as you're ready, Emma, and comfortable, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so before members today, we've got an application uh, at a site located in Clifford Chambers. It's for the change of use of the land to um, a dog walking facility. Uh, and it's a retrospective application because the site is already in use. So on this plan, you can see the boundary of the application site in red. Um, and, oh no, this isn't the plan, sorry. And, in pink, the conservation area, and then you can see the list of buildings as well in red within that conservation area. You can see the residential um, built form to the south of the site, um, and to the north, it's bound by the River Stour. So this is the site in the context of the, the wider area, you can see Stratford town to the north. You've already seen this one, but just to highlight that the applicant uh, also owns the dwelling on the south um, west and then this little parcel that's in equestrian use um, it doesn't form part of the application site so this is the site plan it's showing that there is a proposal to formalize off street parking um, and also maneuverability space as well so that they can exit or the customers can exit in a forward gear you can see that the access is off the main street in Clifford Chambers between two neighbouring dwellings. So this is an aerial photo um, just to show the relationship of the application site with the agricultural land to the north and the village to the south. This is just from a different orientation so you can see the proximity of the site to the village. The yellow star um, indicates where the customers would be parking. So these are some site photos. Um, I'm stood on the access track to the field, looking towards Main Street. Um, the yellow arrow on the, on the right-hand side shows the access in between those two neighbour dwellings. So this is, um, as you approach the site, this is where you would enter. You can see that there's a sign saying access by appointment only. Um, and there's a, there's a login book as well where customers would sign in. Again, just more views into that space. So this is where the parking is proposed. These are photos from within the field where the dogs are able to be let loose. So you can see the boundary treatments. Um, and that relationship that the site has with some of the neighbouring dwellings. Again, more, more site photos showing those boundary treatments. 
And that concludes the presentation. Emma, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's call our first speaker on this item, who is Councillor Les Mosley, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Chairman of Clifford Chambers Parish Council, Clifford Chambers and Milcote, I should say, Parish Council. Uh, good evening, Councillor Mosley. Um, in the same way as everyone else that we've seen so far, you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30-second warning. When you're sat comfortable and ready to go, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I do apologise. I may repeat something that the officers just said. Uh, haven't, I've not been able to witness what you were about to say. Um, uh, mainly, this um, presentation is about the traffic generation um, and road safety. And I'd like to point out that we haven't yet had uh, a visit from the highways department, so um, it has been requested, but uh, has yet to happen. Uh, as councillors can see, the parish council have objected to this application on several planning grounds. Uh, this activity has been ongoing for some time, as we've just heard, which the parish council received numerous complaints about noise, about loose dogs, and issued around vehicles causing near accidents and parking. Therefore, we have responded to the parishioners' views by making this objection. As you've seen, Clifford Chambers is a very small community. It's just off the B4632. The village is contained mainly on a single road known as Main Street, with a number of short avenues off. Now, this road is already very narrow, and due to the parking of cars outside properties with um, no off-road parking, um, this makes it even more so. And also, being a dead end, the road, uh, most visiting vehicles need to traverse Main Street twice, and invariably need to give way to oncoming vehicles. Um, I notice your photograph shows no cars at all outside the vehicle, about outside the houses next to the access. That's a miracle. There are always cars parked outside there. Ninety-nine percent of the time, there are vehicles parked both sides of the road in that location. Access to the site, as you've seen, um, is very narrow. In fact. Um, there's hardly room for more than one vehicle. There certainly isn't room for two vehicles to pass, and therefore any vehicle entering that access, meeting a vehicle coming the other way, which could be one of the residents' vehicles, would have to reverse out onto the main road. And the turn into the entrance is also in the narrowest part of Main Street and often obstructed, as I've mentioned, by parked vehicles. Now, during the six years it took to produce the neighbourhood plan, an area that was highlighted again and again was the issue of parking and access along Main Street. And in an effort to gain parishioners' views and concerns, the Neighbourhood Working Party managed to hold a number of public events. Each one was attended by more than 70 people. In all, 30 seconds. In all of these public consultation events, uh, parking was a major issue. I want to quote the main issue that I see, which is the um, the objective in the neighbourhood plan. The neighbourhood plan makes it quite clear that development proposals should not compromise road safety or increase congestion within the neighbourhood area, particularly uh, along Main Street. The Parish Council therefore asked councillors to refuse this application and in doing so, we hope that you'll support the views of parishioners embodied in the stated objectives of the made neighbourhood plan. However, Based on the fact I'm, that I'm afraid you have, have gone over, visited. I'm afraid you have gone over your time there, so I'm going to have to stop you now. Thank you very much, members. Do we have any? Do we have any questions for our parish council? Councillor Harvey, please. Um, Councillor Mosley, um, can you tell me how many accidents there have actually been along that road? Well. In, in the village itself, the registered number of accidents, uh, I don't have um, specifically. What we have had is uh, a number of uh, eyewitness accounts of near misses and of one motorcyclist having to brake and almost fell off his bike. The, the, dish, the issue with that access is that to come out of it, you'll come out blind. There is no way you can see until you've brought your car beyond the level of the two houses that you saw. This means that pedestrians are at risk and, and because of parked vehicles, which invariably are on both sides of the access, it is impossible to see until you brought your car three quarters of the way out of the access. And that in itself, we consider to be a very high risk. 
the fact that the I, so planning... I'm going I'm to stop you there. I think you answered the question. You know, the question was about the uh, accidents rather than the access itself. Councillor Crump, I believe you've got a, a question along similar lines. Yes, yeah, along similar lines. Thank you, Councillor Mosley. Um, firstly, what is the speed limit? Um, just confirming on that. Please. 20 miles per hour. 20 miles an hour. And secondly, you mentioned as part of the consultation of the NDP there was considerable debate about this. Uh, did you take any professional advice, consultancy, regarding um, traffic movements, etc., or, or, yeah, that's basically the question, right? Uh, uh, no, we didn't at that time. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions for our parish councillor? No? In that case, councillor, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Okay, let's move to our next speaker on this item, who is uh, Mr. Martin Reason. Good evening and welcome. Now, I think you've probably got an idea of how things are going to run. As soon as you're sat comfortable and ready, you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30-second warning. And when you are comfortable, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Martin Reason. I hold power of attorney for my elderly parents, whose property is Hampton Cottage Clifford Chambers, which they've owned for over 40 years. It's situated immediately adjacent to the entrance to River Meadow and has been adversely affected by the unauthorised dog walking business, which has been escalating in scale of activity over the last two years. I myself am a former resident and I represent the fellow residents of Clifford Chambers who have objected to this application, raising a wide range of planning objections, but I will focus on two main grounds for refusal. The entrance to the site is entirely unsuitable and there are significant risks already impacting residents. Access from Main Street is narrow down a single track which leads to Hampton Cottage, my parents' place, and River Meadow. At no point is it more than three metres wide and consequently no vehicle or indeed pedestrian encountering a vehicle can pass. Vehicles en encountering one other, another have to either turn round in Hampton Cottage, causing trespass, drive or, or, or causing trespass, or reverse into the highway. At the entrance, there is no splay. It crosses a pavement and has very limited visibility traveling forwards, let alone in reverse. The suggested condition by the, by the planning officer of timed entrance does not address this, this risk, simply because the planning condition cannot time when residents choose to travel to or from their own houses or 14 Main Street, an adjacent house, which also has access via the single track and whose resident is bound in a wheelchair. Secondly, the proposed dog walking site is located in a predominantly residential location where residents have every right to expect to go about their daily lives without imposed risk from a commercial business inserted into their environment. What risk am I describing? Three properties, as I've said, are located immediately on the entrance itself. Hampton Cottage, 13 Main Street and 14 Main Street. Whether or not you like dogs, the residents of these properties are at risk every day of encountering a dog or a vehicle when leaving or entering their own home. In addition, there are over 25 properties whose gardens adjoin the site and who have cited evidence to STC of uncontrollable dogs gaining access to their own properties. More generally, Local residents have also pointed to the already congested parking and traffic flow problems. 30 seconds. In summary, this application should be refused, not because we are anti-dog, anti-healthy exercise or anti-commercial development. It should be refused because the site is located in an inappropriate residential location where the residents cannot be protected from potential harm and because the access route is unsafe. That is why we're objecting, and that is why the parish council are objecting. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much indeed. Members, do we have any questions, please? No, I, oh, hang on, we've suddenly got two last minute ones. Councillor Dixon first, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Reeson, um, just to clarify in my own mind where your parents reside, because there's residents, vehicles on that track. On that plan there, are we on the left-hand side behind the smallish blue area? Yes, that is Hampton Cottage, and I also cited two other properties. The property 14 Main Street, which is on the other side of the track, uh, that is the resident in that location, 
is disabled, he has, in, he has disability, he's severely impaired, and his only access into his own property is via that track. And he's wheelchair bound. You'll see on the screen now there's a cursor circling number 14, just so you're clear on exactly where it is. Councillor Curtis, please. Oh, you're done? Okay. Um, I, I'll have a quick question, if I may. So you, uh, it sounds like there's activity there already. How often or how many dogs are coming per hour, for example? Is it constant through the day? Are there lots of cars coming in and out? I did submit uh, uh, a file of evidence, which was from, from my parents' camera on the outside of their house, which showed people turning in the drive um, because they couldn't get past meeting in the drive, hiding from each other, um, instances where a, Do dog, a, a dog walker would come, see that he was going to meet a dog coming the other way, go into my parents' drive and hide so that his dog didn't encounter the other. And most of this is because the people who use these type of sites have animals which they don't want to let loose in and, and, and this uh, uh, we're straying a long way away from the question I actually asked you, which was how many people roughly are coming per hour or per day? Are we talking five or six cars per hour, or are we talking one? Not, or? not, not per hour, but um, there will be instances on one, in, on one day, 16, 16 occurrences. I would say the average is somewhere between seven and eight per day, okay. um, and Thank it can you. be from early in the morning till late at night. Understood. Thank you very much. That, that's answered the question. Members, do we have any other questions for Mr. Reason before we let him go? No, Mr. Reason, thank you very much for your time thank and contribution. You. Thank this you for your time. Okay, let's call our last speaker on this item. Who is our applicant? Linda Pollock. Good evening, Mrs. Pollock. Good evening. Uh, now, you will have six minutes. Feel free to use as much or as little of it as you like. Again, I'll give you three min uh, three minutes, a 30 second warning before your time is up. But otherwise, when you're sat ready, comfortable, the floor's yours. Um, I have. Nothing to say except that the Emma Brooker has put forward a very good layout of what happens on our land. She asked us to provide photographs. We have. Um, what she has said, has, we feel, has been very fair. Um, and a lot of the objections have never been made to us by either Mr Reason or the Parish Council. There is another close within the village that is equally as narrow as ours and has down it now eight plus five more properties. It also is single track. And, oh, oh just to, sorry, <laughs> just to confirm, there have been no accidents. Lovely, thank you. That's sorry. well within your time, surprisingly. Um, now, if you wouldn't mind staying seated for questions, I think we have one from Councillor Curtis to start with, please. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Um, can I just ask if um, you would be, were the committee minded to approve um, that looking at the additional conditions that the officer has proposed, that you would be happy with those? More than happy with those. Um, we did discuss the opening hours, um, and the only time they would be of difficulty is on the recommendation of charities and the RSPCA that dogs are not exercised during the high heat of the day, which means that they would have to come after that time. Thank you. Councillor Dixon, next, please. Uh, Councillor Curtis, uh, beat me to the subject. Councillor Crump, please. Uh, thank you. Um, there was uh, one of the objectors mentioned uncontrollable dogs. Uh, have you been aware of any incidents of um, dogs turning to up to your establishment being out of control or, or subsequently being out of control once whilst over there? We do get dogs that have been imported. We do get dogs that have been rescued. And we do get dogs that don't get on with other people. We do get dogs that come to be trained as a puppy. Um, we get a lot of dogs from a charity called Dog for Good, Dogs for Good, who we are volunteers for. They come for free. That is our part of volunteering for that charity and supporting that charity. The charity supports and brings forward dogs that um, help children with autism, onset dementia 
and dis disabled people in wheelchairs. We provide free dog walking during the week for I th that. I think I, I'm going to have to stop you because in the same way that I did for our other speakers, we've strayed a long way from the actual question. Uh, is, are you satisfied your question's been answered? Can I just have a follow slight follow-up, please? Have there been any incidents where members of the public uh, have been put at risk or by any of these uh, uncontrollable, uh, so-called uncontrollable dogs? We had one husky that took on the fencing, um, but I asked him not to come again. Because we have a booking system, I know who comes when. Lovely, thank you. Councillor Harvey, please. <coughs> Good evening. Can, can you tell us anything about um, where your dog walkers live? And can you tell us how many arrive by car as opposed to arrive on foot? I would say 100% arrive by car. Um, sadly, Clifford Chambers is now on the dog walking recommendation footpaths book. So there are 30 dogs in the village that walk in the village. There are three publications that recommend walking in Clifford Chambers. Not our field, just walking in Clifford Chambers. Um, and this became apparent during COVID. We provided during COVID a very strict system, which was recommended by the government that nobody came from further than five miles away. Lovely, thank you. Uh, do we have any, oh, sorry, Councillor Adam, you did put your hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there was some, uh, I think it was the Parish Council alluded to some cases where the neighbouring properties had dogs in their gardens. Um, could you elaborate if that's uh, the case or not from your, your point of view? Again, as for the previous councillor, there was one case where the dog took on the fence. Um, the owner was able to get it back. Um, we asked him and he also offered not to come again. The terms and conditions and the photographs on our Facebook page of the area say how high the fencing is. There are other dog walking areas that have six foot high fencing. We didn't feel it was appropriate for our neighbours to have that. And by the way, we only have five neighbours, not 35 neighbours. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any other questions for our applicant? No, in that case, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Okay, let's move into points of clarification with our officers. Does anyone have any points to be clarified? Councillor Mills first, please. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Um, I wonder, could, there's been a lot made about the uh, access to uh, this dog walking area. Can you put it up again, please, on the photograph? And are they... That's the one. Now... Is it going across a pavement, or is it um, a, a drop curb? Do we know? I'd say that that's both. It's a drop curb and a pavement, yeah. We can't see because there's an arrow in the way, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. There are other photos. Shall I go to the ones at the end? I, 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 can, I can see through the... I can't see through the arrow, obviously, but I've got a quite close view here. It is a dropped curb. But obviously, a drop curb is on a pavement. So there is a pavement that goes across, but it's a drop curb. I think it looks up to be a half an inch deep, if that helps. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Pleasure. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Emma, can you clarify this? Because a lot of it has been made of cars accessing the, the dog walking site. Um, can you just clarify how many properties are? served by this track so you can see that there's hampton cottage here at the rear um and then that would be it i think i, I think isn't that two properties hampton and, and so my, my, I, I suppose my point really chair is that there are probably at least a couple of properties down that track. So vehicles yeah. are going up and down that track anyway to, to serve the properties. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. No problem at all. Councillor Harvey? Um, 
one of the speakers made a point of stating that he believed, uh, if I recall correctly, that Warwickshire County Council Highways had not visited. Do you know whether that's the case? And if it, if it was the case, does it cause you any concern that an opinion has been given by the County Council without a visit? So I can't, I can't comment on whether they have visited the site. They don't usually advise me of that, but I think it's reasonable for them to be able to assess things with their own system and not visit every site. So if they are satisfied that they have the information that they need to assess something just based off the plans and the speed limit and things like that, I wouldn't have any grounds to question what they've said because at the end of the day, they are the expert. So yeah, I hope that answers. Okay, any other points of clarification before I chuck in with mine? No? Okay. Um, so, Emma, on the... I, I, I need, I'm just trying to get my head around the conditions to, so I know exactly what they mean. So, condition three, maximum number of individuals, three, and number of dogs, four, per booking. Does that mean that could be three different people with three, or in this case, four separate dogs? So they're not all coming in one car, they're not one group. They, are, they could be three cars coming separately. So the management plan will stipulate that there's one booking, and in, those, in that one booking, it will be three individuals. So they would be part of a, of a party. So, you know, um, uh, yeah. So it's, so it's a single booking with a maximum number of three people and four dogs? Yes. Okay, so the likelihood it would be one car per booking with a maximum stay of, I think it says, 60 minutes? Yeah, so it's my understanding that they offer 30 minutes and an hour slots, but the condition allows for all of the slots in one day to be an hour long. Um, we, did, we did consider whether it would be appropriate to restrict the number of cars per booking, but it's not really enforceable or easy to monitor, so that's why that's not been proposed. But it's one booking per slot. So in one could argue that whilst you've got three individuals and four dogs per booking, that booking might be for a family and they all might come in individual cars. So it might be three cars. There's, a, there's potential. Okay. And the grace period, 15 minute grace period, that is pre presumably between bookings. Yeah, so one slot ends and then you have 15 minutes for, if anything happens, for then people to vacate and then the next people will arrive at the end of that 15 minute period. So it, it's to mitigate the access being narrow. Access conflict. Yeah. yeah, I understand that. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Curtis. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Thanks for letting me come back on this. Um, uh, yeah, there seems to be uh, quite a bit of ambiguity that's been revealed about the number of cars, and that given that the, the cars seem to be a main objection or a clear objection, would it be feasible, do you think, to have the condition that a booking is a car, a single car, because I think that would, you know, could we, we could be talking about the difference between sort of 15, 20 car movements a day or five or seven. That's quite a bit of difference. Well, it will be maximum six, given there's only six bookings per day. Um, but uh, your point is valid. So we did consider the condition um, when I was drafting this report, but it was on the advice of our enforcement officer that we don't propose that condition, but in the management plan, which I'm just trying to locate, which we have conditioned, I think it stipulates that it will be one car per booking. So even though it's not an explicit condition, that is something that's comprised within the management plan. So, so Mayor Chair, so just to be clear, any, anyone wanting to book, when they're making that booking, it's clear that it is only one car per... Yeah, they will be advised of that. So it says here, in the management plan, which we are conditioning, at number 12, booking slots only allow one vehicle per booking with a maximum of three people per vehicle. Um, okay, I think uh, everyone's done with points of clarification. Yes, let's move into debate. Who'd like to kick us off? I'm going to point a finger. Councillor Kendall, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've listened with interest. and I certainly understand the, uh, the concerns for residents. But as we've just gone through, I think the main concern does sound like the vehicle movements. I think that's been really well tied down by the officer here. And I just, I, I don't think it's going to cause the level of disruption that people fear. I understand the fears, they're completely logical fears to have, but I don't think it's going to cause those, uh, the traffic movements to be 
particularly difficult at all. So with that in mind, I'm in favour of supporting a, you know, a local business, so I will propose we, we grant the application. Thank you very much. Councillor Adam, please. Uh, sort of mirroring uh, the first application, um, I'm quite happy to support a uh, second that, that proposal. I think uh, Councillor Kendall outlined that perfectly. I, I do appreciate the concerns from the local community, but I'm not convinced that they will be realised um, as as much as uh, as is feared based on the, the work that's gone in to, to ensure that. So, yeah, very happy to support on this one. Fabulous, thank you. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you. Um, I would be... I, I, were we minded to support, I think the conditions are good. Um, what I wouldn't want to see would be... And I, I, I accept the applicant's concerns that if it's a very, very hot day, you shouldn't take dogs out for the day. But I think the, for residents, were we minded to approve, being certain in the knowledge that these are the hours from whatever it says in the conditions, 8 till 5 or whatever, and that they are not variable. And I think if it is a very hot day, then I think that's just unfortunate for the dogs. But I, I wouldn't want to see that condition varied for different weather conditions. I mean, it, you're, it, I understand what you're saying. Um, the difficulty for me is that it feels, it seems to me like you're preempting a future application, which is not what's in front of us, to vary. The reality is what we're looking to either uh, uh, agree to or refuse yeah. today has a clear set of uh, timings, yes. and those are the conditions. Good. If something comes in the future as a vary, we'll look at it and the merits of it at that stage, but I'm not going to uh, start trying to preempt. Unless anyone else wants to dive into the debate, because I think we've pretty much covered everything, um, uh, we will go to a vote. So the proposal is to grant in line with the officer's recommendation. Can I have a show of hands for those in favour, please? That is unanimous. So the uh, committee therefore resolves to grant application 22034144 FUL Lamblong into 12 Clifford Chambers. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. Let's move on to our next item, which is application reference 22033314 FUL Garage Blocks in Bishops Itchington. Our presenting officer in just a moment will be Malwina Itziak. Once Malwina has finished breaking all of our new IT, uh, she, <laughs> I'm sure she'll be ready to go. So Malwina, as soon as you're sat comfortable and ready to go, the floor's yours. Okay, good evening. Um, so this application is um, located in uh, Bishops Itchington. Um, it's a former garage site uh, located within the built up area boundary um, of Bishops Itchington. Uh, the site is accessed by the existing access of uh, Starbold Road and a public footpath runs adjacent the eastern um, application site boundary of it, just over there. Um, and as you, as you can see on this plan, the site is sur surrounded by residential dwellings. This is the uh, location of the site um, in the wider context, context um, as you can see. And what is being proposed? Uh, proposed are um, two three-bed detached dwellings, um, one with attached garage serving plot one and another one um, with a detached garage serving plot two. 
Here you can see the proposed uh, plans and elevations. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see um, the proposed dwelling on plot one with the garage attached. And uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see um, the dwelling proposed on plot two. So you can see that the first uh, dwelling has, has a gable to the front and the second dwelling has, to, has gables to the side. And this is the proposed detached garage to serve um, the dwelling on plot two. And this is the site photograph. You can see the garage's site um, just over there. And um, at the time of my site visit, the garages were demolished. This is the site. Um, as you can see, it is uh, fenced off. And um, the public footpath runs adjacent this fence in the rear over there. So the dwellings would, the front elevations uh, would be there. This is the site um, here on the top photo um, as seen from the public footpath. You can see the dwellings uh, in the rear. And this photo shows um, the area to the rear of the dwellings near the access way. So these are the dwellings um, near the access way to the north of the site. And um, just a little bit of a background. Um, there was an application for two dwellings, um, four bed dwellings uh, that was previously uh, withdrawn. Um, and uh, there were some issues related to impact on the residential amenity that have been addressed by amendment and it has been considered that um, the, pro the proposed dwellings uh, are on balance acceptable and within the guidelines. Okay, I think that's all, thank you. Malwina, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our first speaker on this item, who is Adam Dugmore, Chairman of Bishop Tittington Parish Council. Good evening. Thank you for your patience. I think you know the drill now. Three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning when you're sat comfortable, ready to go. The floor is yours. Push, push the button on the right. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, seven residents have written objections outlining their legitimate concerns about the negative impact that shoehorning these houses in will have on their residential amenity. They have modest south facing gardens which they currently enjoy, but it will be overshadowed by these new dwellings. While the report asserts that the 13 metre separation can be achieved, this is based on the back walls of the upper storey rooms, not the ground floor spaces, which extend a few metres closer, reducing this to only 10 or 11 metres, um, possibly three metres less when one considers the actual back wall, the wall of the garage being proposed on plot one. Um, the nearest property, 19 Starbold Road, will see most of its um, source of daylight from the south blocked by this. No mention has been made through the application nor in the officer's report of the flooding issues that plague that particular area. The nice little grass section that was shown earlier on um, is very frequently waterlogged and sections of the existing hard standing area has been known to disappear under six inches or more of water. Starbold Road today is an outstanding example of a mismatch between parking need and provision. It has actually got worse. The garages that have been destroyed here were built to provide parking to the residents of Starbold Road. The prospect of redevelopment as something other than equivalent or better parking provision is a failing in the first place to the detriment of those residents. The report cites part O of the development requirements SPD insofar as it requires two spaces each for these three bedroom dwellings. It is fantasy to believe that the garages there will ever be used to park a car, especially as the officer deems them too small to also house cycle storage. So it is inevitable that second cars will litter the street. Further, it claims that the development will not increase on-road parking requirements. 
However, the rounding down of the total 0.4 visitor spaces required means that all visitors are assumed to be parking on the street, exacerbating the already very difficult situation on Starbold Road. The application itself adds nothing, very little to nothing to the parish, which has in fact grown by 482 dwellings in the core strategy period, not the 203 argued by the report, which conveniently can disregard the 270 to the north of the village because they're on a brownfield site. The proposal here providing speculative residential properties for which no housing need has been demonstrated. If the committee is minded to grant this application, it does so disregarding the concerns of numerous residents casting those aside for the gain of, of individuals with no apparent relationship or interest in contributing to the social or economic fabric of the village. I was just about to give you a 30 second warning and you finished. So Surprise. thank you very much indeed. Uh, members, do we have any questions please for our parish council? Councillor Harvey, please. <clears throat> All right, good evening. Hello. Uh, page 65 of the, officer, of the paper, the officer's report makes reference to the nearly adopted NDP. Mm -hmm. Two questions then. Um, could you tell us where it is in the process? Uh, the regulation stage yet? And, and yeah. uh, the officer makes a point that the NDP supports the principle of new housing development within the built up area boundary. Is that the case? Okay, so I'll, I'll take those two questions separately then. So in response to the first one, it has passed a referendum and is due to be made, I believe this week, at your cabinet meeting. And in response to the second question, um, yes, in respect of that policy, you're correct in that wording. However, there is also a policy that requires such development not to be to the detriment of residential amenity of adjoining properties. <laughs> Anyone else with a question? No? Councillor Dugmore, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Okay, our last speaker uh, on this item is Councillor Chris Kettle. <laughs> What's that for? Do, do come and sit down, Councillor Kettle. Councillor Crump is having a joke at your expense, but I shouldn't worry too much about that. Um, so, Councillor Kettle, you will have uh, your usual five minutes. Uh, I'll give you a 30-second warning before your time is up. Use as much or as little of that time as you wish. Um, otherwise, when you're ready, sat comfortable and good to go, the floor is yours. Councillor Kettle, having taken great care Evening. to log yourself into that, you might want to press on before you I've speak. managed to get it working fine. <laughs> um, Evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there is design, there is good design, and there is appalling design. Um, this part of the village uh, was built as an estate called the Lake and Drive Estate uh, and comprises about four roads um, of owner-occupied owner uh, through to what were originally built as council houses, and this location is uh, the area where most council houses were built. Very small properties, mainly terraced but with a, uh, a continuing design from one end of the Lake and Drive estate to the other. Um, whilst they're different size, <coughs> you can see right from the beginning, they all form part of the same estate. What we've got here on an area set aside for garaging, garages is two completely different designed properties dropped into a bit of space, crammed in to a bit which was formerly used for car parking. The officer hasn't shown any photographs of what this part of the Lake and Drive estate looks like on a Friday evening or a Saturday, where um, it is impossible to park without blocking somebody else in, because once, when, this, when this estate was originally built, it was clearly um, not that many people had cars. Now, most properties have two cars, and there is complete inadequate space in this part of the estate for car parking. It has been suggested to the Parish Council they might like to build a multi-storey car park. This is a serious pro proposition put forward, mainly because around the Lake and Dryland Estate, there is no spare room for parking. What we're doing here is we are taking away garages some of which were not used for car parking, but so, sorry, Mr. Chairman, do you want to wait while you have a chat? 
Um, I, I was getting advice from my officers, which is a normal course. If you want to carry on with okay. your bit, Thank that you. would be great. Thank you. Um, I didn't want to lose my thread, that's all. Um, what we lost, we lost the car parking areas. Uh, and what, not only that, is we're now going to replace it with more car parking. Um, and that is a major, major problem, because I can tell you one thing, the sole payment we might, not, we might get will not provide a multi-storey car park. Um, other things about the design, it's very clear that garages should be subservient to the main property, and yet one of these garages is sitting in front of the property. Since when did that become acceptable? It has never been acceptable, but we're now saying it is in this case because it is behind some other properties. But every other property, the main building is, is not, uh, well, the, small, the garage is not subservient to the main building and sticks out in front of it. Um, so my concern here is, is all about the design and the car parking. Um, I pick up Councillor Doug Moore's comment about flooding. There has been considerable surface water flooding in this area, um, not mentioned in the report at all. This will exacerbate the, the, the issue again. Um, I'm not going to go on any further, Mr Chairman. If you want to do a decent job and we have a design guide as part of our core strategy, we have a policy, CS9, which is all about good design. If we're going to follow our core strategy, please, let's follow our core strategy and not just accept these things because they happen to be tucked into a spare corner of the village. It is unacceptable, this design. It should not be accepted by this district council because otherwise we might just say, let's accept anything, whatever it looks like, because it's a spare bit of ground. I will add, Bishops has had so much more housing than it was allocated in the original core strategy. And I would remind you, in the core strategy, the inspector's report on that, on that core strategy said that the 2,000 houses allocated local service villages should give certainty to developers and residents, and that is the exact word, of what they should expect in terms of housing numbers. When we are 400 properties plus, there will be more than that, actually, 400 properties plus over the numbers that seconds. we eradicated, then that is, uh, again, no reason why we should be jamming extra houses into this patch. Thank you. Do we have any questions for our ward member members? Councillor Mills, first, please. Good evening, Councillor Kettle. Um, the garages, who... Well, they're not there anymore, but who owns the gar did own the garages? They were Orbit garages. And they're Orbit garages. And the, the housing there, are they mainly Orbit properties? All Orbit properties. Thank you very much. Councillor Crump, please. Hello, Councillor Kettle. Um, I think flooding is mentioned in the report on page 70, but I've got a query for the officer on points for clarification in a minute, so I'll be mentioning that. Um, yeah, three questions. First of all, how long have the garage has been empty? Are, is there any sign of der dereliction or disrepair to them? And do any residents currently park in that disused parking area? The garages before they were sold off by Orbit um, all were allocated to um, Orbit residents. Um, and under the Orbit agreement, they could be given notice and were given notice some years ago um, to vacate those properties. Some were clearly used for non-garaging purposes. They were used for storage. Um, some were not. Some one were, were used for garaging because that's what they were designed for. Um, they were knocked down. I can't quite remember when they were knocked down. Councillor Dugmore might be able to tell me when they were knocked down, but uh, they, they, you know, clearly they, they were knocked down. They weren't in very good state of repair because all of it hadn't spent any money on them. Um, and some of the two were not actually terribly safe. But that does not um, remove the fact that it was an area allocated for parking for these properties in the 1970s when the Lake and Drive the state was built, I remember it being built, um, and we are, with a stroke of a pen, at risk of removing a really important area of parking for those residents at this end of the village. Councillor Curtis, please. Oh, just bear with me, Councillor Curtis. Sorry, Councillor Crump, you've got a follow-up, have you? No, it's, one of my questions wasn't answered. <laughs> Do any residents currently park in the disused parking area? I'm, I'm going to work on the basis of the photo that we've seen shows that they've been knocked down and it's fenced off. The answer is no. Oh, that's all right. Fine. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Councillor Kettle. Um, obviously, Orbit have removed this parking provision 
Can you just clarify whether or not um, Orbit made any other provision in place of these garages that were knocked down? Uh, no. There were, there were, when, when those garages disappeared, there was, the, the residents were kicked, or, or the tenants were kicked out of that area um, and made to park on the street. I mean, it, it is a, it's quite a narrow cul-de-sac, and if I'm visiting people in that part of those villages, I know I park and I block about 10 people in um, and leave, you know, you can't go into a house because you know somebody might want to move out. That is how serious the parking problem is in this area. And this, this proposal is going to exacerbate that um, considerably. It, you know, it may not be the greatest things, but for the residents of that part of the village, this is going to create a significant bigger problem for parking than has already been the case, and it's pretty bad already. Okay, Councillor Harvey, please. Can I just ask you... Good evening, Councillor Kettle. Good evening. <clears throat> um, could I just ask you to explain that? I'm sat here thinking um, whether this particular site is developed or not, the parking problems that there are in the, in the vicinity are the parking problems in the vicinity. So could you explain to me how, if consent was given and the, these two properties were built, could you explain how you think the parking problem would be exacerbated? Firstly, these are quite significant properties. There is, as with most properties of this size, there will be more than one car allocated to them, and therefore there will be um, more cars than the single garage, which we can see on the plan. Uh, we'll, there will be, there'll be a demand for a greater number of spaces than there actually is available on the property. Therefore, those cars are going to have to go somewhere else. The area that is currently, or was currently the garage area, was an area where people were able to park. Now that is no longer going to be available for that because they're going to have houses on it. So where, you know, what is going to happen to that space? It is lost to, as a facility to the village. Councillor Harvey, you don't look any... overly satisfied with the answer. I mean, I does it, have, has your, your question been answered? It's been answered. Marvellous. Let's move on then. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have any questions for our ward member? No. Councillor Kettle, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Members, let's move to points of clarification with our officers. Who would like to kick us off? Councillor Adam first, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was alluded to by the uh, parish councillor that the distance from the, I think it was plot one, the building itself for the house was uh, met, met the minimum distance requirements, but that the garage, I think, didn't. Uh, are you just uh, able to elaborate whether that's the case or not, please? Um, yes, so um, part F uh, of development requirements, SPD, sets out the minimum separation distances between um, two-storey walls. So uh, this is how the proposal was assessed. Uh, and uh, on this site plan, you can see that the minimum would be uh, achieved. Just quickly. Uh, uh, sorry, do you mind if I just see the um, the elevations on the garage? Um, the, or are these the building that has the attached garage, please? So, so this would be um, the dwelling plot number one. And the separation distance was measured from the two-storey wall in accordance with part F of the SPD to the two-storey wall of the neighbor, neighboring property. Okay, but it's the, the gable of the garage that's up against the boundary or adjacent to the boundary. I'm reading that right. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, no, that's, right. that's all. Thank you. Okay, and Councillor Harvey, please. <clears throat> I'm conscious of the point that Councillor Kettle made about the predominance of terraced former council housing in the area. I'd like if you can, to tell me how many other instances of houses of this sort of design are present in the vicinity of Bishop Itchington? Um, so, uh, looking at the photographs, um, 
the predominant design of housing is this one, plot number two, um, that has dual pitched roof and side gables. So, um, however, on the photo, you can also see um, larger dwellings built to the um, south of the site. Um, as you can see on this photo here, uh, so they're slightly larger um, to the ones that you can see um, on the for on the foreground, um, and the different design of plot number one um, was requested by me to overcome to basically overcome the issue of potential loss of light to the property that is located to the north. So because the change to the roof design, um, the change to the roof design on plot one um, resulted in, the, in this dwelling to meet the standards um, of impacts on the residential amenity. And although this design is slightly different to what is in the area, I also considered I can show you um, a photograph of the street scene. So for example, on here you can see a Starbolt Road and these properties are to the north of the site and the proposed dwelling uh, would, on plot number one would be located here. And the roof line uh, although the over overall design would be slightly different to what is in the area, the, the roof line, this different roof line of plot one would follow the roof lines uh, within Starbolt Road, which would essentially harmonize better in the street scene as seen from Starbolt, within Starbolt Road. Okay, do we have any more points for clarification? Oh, sorry, Councillor Crump has stuck his hand up. Oh, crikey, everyone is now. <laughs> Councillor Crump next, please. Yeah, just, just a couple of brief ones, Mr Chairman. Uh, firstly, on page 70, it says that building regulations will be able to secure um, suitable drainage for the site. Um, so that meets that requirement. And secondly, the SPD regarding highways and parking, we've reached our minimum. There's just some little bit which says, I note that the Highway Authority was unable to ascertain whether the sizes of the proposed car parking, car parking spaces are sufficient as no dimensions were shown on the submitted plans. So therefore, do we still meet those minimum parking requirements? Councillor Kettle, just to inform you, I have seen you. You can stop waving your hand now. We're going to finish off everyone speaking and asking questions and then I'll come to you. So, um, sorry, what was the first question? Were there two questions or just one yeah, about parking? the first parking? one was, are we satisfied that the building regulations will be able to provide sufficient flooding um, alleviation to, to make uh, alleviate any problem? And the second one was to do with the minimum requirements, parking requirements, SPD, but there was a query rega regarding the dimensions and the highways authority would, so are we still meeting that SPD? Okay, uh, so um, to respond to your first question, um, the drainage uh, will be, um, sufficient drainage will be provided through the building regulations and uh, also currently the site is basically just hard standing and the proposed uh, residential gardens would essentially help to ease that problem because uh, there would be most likely grass or just, you know, um, so the, the drainage would be, um, I assume, would be essentially improved as a result of the development. And um, to respond to your second question about parking, I measured the uh, proposed spaces and the, the widths of the garage doors, and it accords with our standards. Uh, so sufficient parking will be provided for both of the dwellings. Thank you. Councillor Redden, next, please. Councillor Mills, did I see your hand go up? We'll come back to Councillor. Uh, Melwina, do we know, is it, are they open market housing or are we going straight back to, I couldn't see, are they all bit open, 
Uh, yes, I believe they're market housing. Okay, thanks. It, it was assessed as market housing. Right. Councillor Adam, are you ready for me to come back to you or shall I wait? I think, okay, did I see a hand come up over this side? Councillor Kess, did you stick a hand up a minute ago? Have you anyone else got any points of clarification? Now, Councillor Kettle, you've stuck your hand up. Just to remind you that we can only call you forward for, uh, to clarify a point of fact. Is that what you're coming to clarify? If you're going to speak, I need you to speak into a microphone, but I need you to confirm that it's going to be clarifying a point of fact. Yeah? Okay. Um, the question was asked by Councillor Harvey as to whether there were any other similar properties to these two being proposed. Um, I mentioned this is part of the Lake and Drive estate, where all the properties are for an almost identical vernacular, obviously with more detail than the bigger properties compared to the smaller ones. Uh, the planning officer has related to a different estate which faces in a different direction uh, that is somewhere away where, again, all those properties, they're different to the Lake and Drive estate, but there is a, a similar vernacular among all those in that estate. There is nowhere in this part of the village, in fact, there is nowhere in the whole village where you've had two properties parachuted into a spe small spare, of pa spa spare patch, um, as Councillor Harvey asked. It, does, it has not happened anywhere else in this village. Every other property matches the local vernacular of its estate. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, have we got any more points of clarification before we move into debate? No, let's move into debate. Who would like to kick us off? Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think we've all uh, come across Orbit uh, selling off its garages and uh, houses being created and built on such plots. And it's always a great sadness to lose those parking options. But I think these parking options have already gone. Um, the residents aren't parking there now. They are already forced onto the streets. So whether or not two houses go onto that plot or not, that land is no longer a car park and it's no longer a facility for garaging of cars. Um, now, Councillor Kettle made great reference to the design aspects, uh, how the, the uh, two detached houses don't fit into the, the terracing effect of what were ex-council houses both in the 1970s. Well, I don't know how you can actually create terracing, um, which would therefore meet uh, the design of the local housing. Um, and my recollection of 1970s and looking at the photographs, um, that's nothing to be repeated to my mind. Um, so I'm minded to uh, go along with the officer's recommendation and uh, propose that we actually grant permission, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Dixon. I wasn't actually alive in the 70s, so I'm glad you, you can remind us all about it. <laughs> uh, Councillor Mills is next on my list, please. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I do have some sympathies with Councillor Kettle on this one. Uh, we've got the same, yeah, the same situation in Kyneton, uh, Orbit. Um, uh, I've stopped people parking where the garages are. Uh, they're doing it all around uh, the district. I do believe that Orbit have a duty of care uh, to their residents. Um, I, I can't support this because... Um, I obviously didn't support the last application came in for Kyneton, so I'll be qu quite duplicitous on that. So uh, I can't support the officer's recommendation on this. Mr Chairman, thank you. Just so I'm clear, are you making a counter-proposal to refuse? And if you are, I, I, I'll come back to you for reasons in a second. OK, yeah. You are making a yeah. counter-proposal to refuse. Yeah. I'll come back to you for reasons if we need them. Uh, Councillor Kendall, next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll be as quick as I can. I, I, don't, I think the question of poor design is highly subjective, and as Councillor Dixon says, I don't see how you'd manage to come up with some sort of terrace plan in this location anyway. Um, the parking is already gone. I think this is a logical infill. I'm happy to second the proposal to grant. Thank you very much. Councillor Adam, please. Thank you. Um, I'm more sympathetic to uh, Councillor Mills's point of view on this, I think. I, <clears throat> I must say, I mean, I... Terracing aside, I'm not impressed by the design, particularly the garage right in front of the front door. Um, I think slightly more egregious. I'm also not comfortable with the fact that the garage on the other side, which is adjacent to another boundary, has that gable end there. If it were 
a duo pitch or a lean two in the other direction, it might have a less impactful sort of shadow. But I think particularly sort of somebody who uses a south facing garden myself, I, I find that that would, there's no way that that couldn't have an impact on lighting. Um, I, on top of that, I mean, I know we have sort of say every time it comes up, I'm still not happy about the overdevelopment of of our settlements. And I know we keep going back to this same um, inspector's re uh, report comment, which I've seen a number of times, but I mean, I know Bishop Sitchington and it has had a huge amount of development uh, and the satellite development near it has, does count towards that and the, the development of the area. Um, and the the amenities that they require, I think that the the in my reading of that the the vernacular used approximately and around is used as a justification for allowing development. I think it can also be used conversely uh, in that we can say fairly definitively that um, a doubling of uh, of a number is not around the number that was intended. Um, I, I'm really not comfortable with this based on how it is. I think there are infills that work on these sites. I don't like them necessarily, but you know we do see them. I think the parking issue is one that I am concerned about as well, particularly as the garages are, and the, even the parking spaces aren't sized um, for the Highways Authority to, uh, to really comment on. I'm happy to second Councillor Mills's um, uh, proposal to uh, to refuse and if, if we need more uh, robust reasoning then I'm happy to try and provide that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just so um, we're clear, we have the proposal to grant uh, was seconded prior to your seconding of the proposal to refuse. So that will be the vote we have first. If that fails, I will then make sure that we get our full reasoning from the two of you. Okay, uh, Councillor Curtis, next please. Thank you very much, <coughs> Chair. Um, Councillor Adam has been extremely eloquent I agree with pretty much every, everything he's said, and but particularly about the overbearing nature over the garden of that north garage, and that doesn't seem to have been fully the, the nature of that uh, doesn't seem to have been fully taken into account in the officer's report. I think it's more serious than is alluded to in the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harvey. <coughs> I'm inclined to support uh, Councillor Dixon's point of view. The the question of parking, the, the statements from the case officer and Councillor Kettler are diametrically opposed. It's, it strikes me that the parking has been lost. Uh, the parking that's required, generated by these two houses, is self-contained within the site. This site has to be used for something. The, end, the, the neighbourhood development plan uh, supports housing development. It's within the built up area boundary. Uh, we can have a dis discussion about design. The, the officer has considered it. Um, you could argue that uh, it's it, almost impossible to put a, a design together that fits in with a, a, a series of terraced houses. Um, you could make the argument that these two sites, these two properties, sit better with the properties to the south. Um, it may not be a perfect application. It may, be, it may not be an ideal solution. But on balance, I take the point of view it, it merits support. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anyone else before we go to a vote? Okay, so the proposal is to grant, in line with the officer recommendation made by Councillor Dixon, seconded by Councillor Kendall. Can I have a show of hands for those in favour of granting, please? Six. Six. And those against? Three. The committee therefore resolves to grant application 2203314 FUL garage blocks um, at Stobble Road in Bishop's Itchington. Now, me um, members, we've been going for an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I've drunk too much coffee, so we are going to have a two-minute uh, pit stop, and we'll be back here as quickly as possible, please.
OK, members, thank you very much for indulging me there. Oh, we will move to our last item. Oh, excuse me, which is um, application reference 2202408FUL and 220409LBC. Uh, this is uh, in Warmington, um, and our presenting officer is once again Malwina. Okay, so um, this application is um, for planning permission and a listed building consent um, uh, for an extension um, to a dwelling known as the Dean uh, in Warmington. Uh, here on this slide you can see um, the application site in the wider context. Um, the site is washed over by um, the conservation area and AOMB designations. And as you can see on this location plan, this is the main property which is grade two listed. And it also includes um, part of the listed range here. However, the works are proposed to the main dwelling. Uh, it is proposed to demolish the existing single story extensions to the rear and replace with a two-story extension. Here you can see um, the aerial view of the site. And on this slide, we can see the existing site plan. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see the single-story extension there. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is the proposed extension. This element here is two-story, and it also has two single-story flat roof extensions, one to one side and one on the other. On this slide, you can see um, the existing and proposed elevations. So. Um, here you can see the existing elevation. This is the front of the main house and the existing single-story extension. And this is the rear elevation. You can see the single-story extensions, um, existing extensions are there. And uh, at the bottom, on the left-hand side, this is how the proposed extension um, would appear from the as seen from the front of the property. And this is how it would look um, as seen from within the rear garden. Here you can see uh, the site elevations. So um, this is the existing extensions here. And at the bottom you can see uh, the proposed two-story extension, and here you can see the flat roof element and um, the proposed west elevation as seen there with the flat roof element between the main dwelling and the two-story extension. So this is the main um, property um, as seen from the front. You can see um, that this eastern elevation um, would be seen within the street scene. Uh, you can see the existing single-story elements there and the proposed two-story extension would be visible in the street scene, uh, but not from the unlikely from the other side. This is the existing single-story extension as seen from um, within the drive. And this is the existing rear elevation. The extension would be located here. And this is another um, view towards the rear elevation. Uh, 
Um, and the case officer recommended the applications both for planning permission and for the listed building consent to be refused. Um, the council's conservation officer considered that the proposed extension is um, not acceptable and would cause harm to the heritage assets. And uh, it was also considered that the, the proposed extensions by reason of their scale would be inappropriate and also um, the other recommended, the other a refusal of reason is on design grounds. Thank you. Malwina, thank you very much indeed. Our first and only speaker on this item is Councillor Fielding. Councillor Fielding, do come forward, please. Uh, you will have five minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. Use as much or as little of the five minutes as you wish. Once you're sat, comfortable and ready to go, press the button on the right and I will start the timer. Councillor Fielding, if you're going to speak, would you mind turning your microphone on? If and as I said, I will give you a 30-second warning before your time is up. But if when I am under time, can you please let me know? I, can let, I, I will let you know. Right. The, bu the building has been altered and enlarged over the course of centuries. It was built in the 17th century with an 18th century ex addition. And in the 1990s, the property was enlarged again with an extension running at right angles to the 18th century addition. The proposal is to replace the external staircase that runs outside the building, which the conservation officer doesn't like. The new extension will accommodate a passage between the first floor of the 18th century and the, f and the first floor bedroom area at the back of the building. The staircase referred to will be enclosed within the extension and we re realigned to give access to the first floor. A new access from the first floor of the 18th century extension is to, um, to a new extension will be formed by removing a window. This opening will be enlarged to provide a doorway between the two parts of the building. The accommodation the accommodation re replacement, sorry, to accommodate the re re requirements of the case, uh, conservation office, the glass panels will be incorporated in the walls of the extension so the existing stonework will be visible. The applicant's agent has gone along with the planning officer's comments about reducing the size of the extension, particularly the size of the new bedroom area. The planning officer states that CS9, the development proposal, will be sensitive to the settings and the existing building form and will reflect the extent context of the location. She states that the general, generous size of the garden that also includes a swimming pool and overall distance from the neighbouring developments ensures that despite the size of the proposed extension, no neighbouring residents will be impacted on the extension. Therefore, she considers in accordance with CS 9 and 20 of the strategy. However, in her conclusion, she states that the proposals fail to comply with SDP and also CS 9 and CS 20. With regards to all grade two listed buildings, one must prove that there is less than substantial harm that the public benefits and the public benefits beco become important. The NPPF paragraph seven and the PPG state that anything which delivers economic, social and environment objectives of sustainability development as described in the NPPF should be taken into account. The PPG states clearly that the public benefits must flow from the development and must be of a nature of scale that would benefit the public at large. But those benefits do not always have to be visible or accessible to the public or to all sections of the public to be a genuine public benefit. Thus, less than substantial harm must be considered the, the public benefits, sorry, thus less than substantial harm must consider the public benefits derived from the development. I would therefore argument argue that the ex extending the dean and the building of a new extension meets the above criteria.
the social benefits to an applicant that enjoys entertaining and having a number of people coming to stay, the environmental in, uh, improvements to climate change, improving insulation, and a more easily manageable property. Thus, I ask that this be granted. There are no uh, additional uh, objections apart from one of the um, parish councillors who has put no reps in, hence one of the reasons why there is no parish councillors coming in support. Apart from that, there are no objections from any of the neighbours. The, in my view, the, the extension is... Um, in 30 seconds. ...and will improve the well-being and the accommodation within a tarred house where the existing bedrooms are of an ancient design. Thank you, Councillor Fielding. You asked me to say how much time you've got left. You've got uh, 11 seconds and 19 milliseconds. Do you want to use them? <laughs> Good. OK, members, do we have any questions for our ward member, please? Councillor Mills. John, um, you, you said the, the existing extension, when was that built? That's 1919. 1919. Yeah. Right. It's in the paperwork. John, uh, could you I, put your microphone on, please? Apologies. Yeah, I tried to find it. But, yeah, okay. It's, it's in the paperwork that uh, they were in 99, um, where they got permitted to conditions and listing building approval. Do you say 19 or 90? 90. But the actual application went forward. I, I, think, the, I think the question has been answered now. Could, does anyone else have any questions for Councillor Fielding? No, Councillor Fielding, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Members, do we have any points of clarification for our officers, please? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, public benefit in your report. Sorry, Councillor Harvey, I'm going to ask you to turn your microphone towards you. Thank, so you that, thank you very much. In your report, you make reference to public benefit only once, and that's in your conclusion, as far as I could see. Um, given that there is harm being caused to a listed building, there needs to be some element of public benefit in order to compensate for that harm. Is the absence of your mention of public benefits in your report a reflection of the fact that you think there are none? Or if you think there are some, what might they be? So just to clarify, Malvina wasn't the case officer, so she didn't write the report. She's just pre presenting the item, which is why I'll, I'll answer the question. But, but yes, essentially the fact that the officer hasn't gone into detail in terms of public benefits in the main body and has just concluded that there aren't any um, is because officers do not consider there to be public benefits sufficient to outweigh that harm. Um, it's, to my mind, a solely private benefit. There may be some minor economic benefits from um, construction employment in the short term, so that would be a public benefit, but to my mind would be given limited weight and certainly wouldn't outweigh the harm that the conservation, I uh, conservation officer has identified. QED. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you. Um, just two points, if I, if I may. Malvina, on that photo that you're showing there, with your cursor, could you just sort of outline where the, the sort of height of the proposed extension would go? <coughs> and just a... Um, so, um, can you see the cursor? I'm not entirely sure. Um, so, so the extension would um, would go to the just up there. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. And but my other, and actually, Malvina, you may not be able to answer this, and I'm, I'm sometimes I get easily confused. Um, on page 18, um, just picking up one of the points that's been made. I'm slightly confused because at the top of page 80, the report, which I appreciate isn't your report, it says the proposals are therefore considered to accord with policies CS9 and CS20. Four or five paragraphs further down, it says the proposal 
fails to accord with the policies of CS8 and uh, sorry, CS9 and CS20. Now I know obviously different policies are given different weight, but I was slightly confused by how it can both accord and not accord with those two policies. Can you explain that to me, please? Yeah, absolutely. So policy CS9 um, includes both design in the visual sense and also residential amenity. So where we're saying at the top of page 80 that it complies with policy CS9, that's in respect to the residential amenity aspect. So we think the impact on residential amenity is acceptable. Where we're talking about a conflict of CS9 in the conclusion relates to the design impacts, which are considered to be unacceptable, um, and that's further set out, and the reasons for that set out are in the design and distinctiveness section of the report on page 79. So we're basically saying we don't think the design is okay, but we think residential amenity is. So there's a partial conflict, partial compliance. Thank you for that. Excellent explanation. <laughs> Thank God Alice is here. That's all I can say. <laughs> 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 Any other questions for clarifying members? No, let's move to the debate. Who'd like to kick us off? Councillor Harvey, please. Uh, this is, to me, absolutely straightforward. Uh, this is a proposal which causes harm to a listed building. We have a statutory obligation under the 1990 Act to take that into account. There are The officers have not provided any discernible public benefits to offset this harm. The application cannot receive my support. Just to be clear, that is a proposal to refuse. A re proposal to refuse. Thank you very much. Councillor Adam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the plan is um, to replace or part of a beautiful house with another beautiful looking house. However, um, I don't see any public benefits. The conservation officer, in their professional opinion, judges it to be harmful and overly dominant. Um, and if it wasn't listed, I'd love it, but we need to treat these things as antiques. Uh, so I'm happy on this occasion to go with the officer's recommendation and second Councillor Harvey. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Councillor Curtis? No? Anyone else? In that case, let's move to a vote. The proposal is... Uh, now, just to, I want to be absolutely clear, this is on the FUL. And we'll come to the LBC in a second. So on the FUL, the proposal is to refuse in line with the officer recommendation made by Councillor Harvey, seconded by Councillor Eden. Could I have a show of hands for those in favour of refusing, please? That is unanimous. Uh, so the committee therefore resolves to refuse application 22.02408 FUL. Now on the LBC, Councillor Harvey, can I assume that you are prepared to uh, propose the refusal in line with the officer recommendation again? Correct. And Councillor Eden to second? Of course. Marvellous. Unless anyone else wants to say anything, we will go for a vote. So again, Proposal is to uh, refuse in line with the officer's recommendation made by Councillor Harvey, seconded by Councillor Eden. Could I have a show of hands for those in favour of refusal, please? That is unanimous. The committee therefore resolves to refuse application 22.02409 LBC. Um, I don't believe we have any urgent business. No, in that case, members, thank you very much for your time. Uh, officers, thank you for your time and contributions, and of course, for all our speakers as well. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks very much. <laughs>